premise of visionary fiction is that all organizing is science fiction. That every time we imagine a world without prisons, a world without borders, a world without these oppressive structures, that's science fiction because we've never seen that world. But we can't build what we can't imagine. The limitations of our imagination is one of the biggest mechanisms of social control. Because if we can't imagine it, then we can't bring it to reality and to fruition. And I love this quote by Ursula K. Le Guin, who's an incredible um, visionary uh, uh, fiction writer that says, we live in capitalism. Its power seems inescapable. So did the divine right of kings. Any human power can be resisted and changed by human beings. And you know, I love this quote. You know, I love the referencing of the divine right of kings because you know, outside of Game of Thrones, most of us don't think that's necessarily the best way to structure a society. We all we didn't end well for for them or for us. You know, at the end of, of Game of Thrones. But um, you know, there there was there were times when people could not imagine anything else was possible except this idea that God gave the right to the king to do literally whatever the king wanted. Um, and it wasn't until people remembered there were other ways of existing and said, let's reenact those ways of existing here, that they were able to build something different. And so the, the limitations, again, are really our imagination. And once our imagination is unshackled, liberation is limitless. And so to me, the, the creation of the idea of visionary fiction is about giving organizers, activists, change makers, revolutionaries, space to play, and also giving writers the understanding that they have the joyous responsibility of helping to shape the present and the future, and reminding writers of that. Um, and hopefully getting writers to ask the question, what is, is the point of my work? Uh, in a, not just in a present sense, in a futuristic sense. So using this term, visionary fiction, oh, that was not supposed to come up first. Never mind. Spoiler. Spoiler. <laughs> um, so I started using the term visionary fiction uh, a little over 10 years ago to really talk about the uh, fantastical art that can help to create the revolutionary liberated futures we want. And I started using the term for a couple reasons. I'm not invested in the term, so I'm not, I'm definitely not, you know, I think there's a lot of debates around terms um, in terms of like, do we want this term or not to encompass the entirety of our existence and our literary movement and our revolutionary movements? I think if a term, if a term is useful, use it. If it's not, then talk about the values and principles. And you should be talking about the values and principles anyway, right? Um, but I started using visionary fiction, one, because there are so many, you know, before I was saying like science fiction, and there, you know, so many, so much media, books, films are science fiction, and it's not revolutionary except as a cautionary tale, right? Just the replication of existing power structures. Because, you know, genres are not inherently revolutionary in and of themselves, they're used, and they're most often used for repression. And so we get the same colonial, you know, space western narratives over and over and over again. That to me is not the future I want. And again, it's not helpful except it's like, dear God, not another white man who's military in a white space suit saving the world from an asteroid or alien. Don't want it, thank you. Um, the other reason I started using this term is for my nerds, because I would say, like, radical sci-fi, you were like, you are clearly talking about fantasy here, not science fiction. Um, I believe she's talking about magical realism. You're both wrong. It's horror. And I'm like, oh my god. I love you all so much. Be quiet right now. <laughs> so uh, visionary fiction is a bucket term that uh, encompasses weird stuff, right? So the, the sort of encapsulated definition of visionary fiction, it is fantastical art that helps us to understand and challenge existing power structures and supports us in imagining paths to dreaming and creating more just worlds. So that's the like dictionary version. So I'm actually writing an annotation about visionary fiction, which is very strange to annotate a made up term. I mean, all terms are made up, right? It's just, I made it up. So I'm like, I don't know, what do I reference? Me? Um, the less 
illustrious would be him or his dad. So, the, but so, um, why, so we cre I created this term um, and I did a lot of the work, initial work around it with Morgan Phillips, who was in the video talking about her short story, The Long Memory, which focuses on um, Guantanamo Bay hung hunger strikes, and uh, she's put it in this like fantasy, fantastical world. But so I was like, great, we have a term, this is awesome, and people are like, all right, well, how do we know what visionary fiction is? And I was like, oh, you want me, you want me to do more? <laughs> okay. I thought it was just enough to just stay. And then people are like, this is visionary fiction. I'm like, ooh, I, I'm not caught up on terms, but no. <laughs> no. Right? So kind of doing this work, and then definitely working with my co-editor, Adrian, who is uh, an amazing, I think she's doing a lot of this work about like, how do we like be visionary fiction? How do we bring it into our movements? She has an incredible book, Emergent Strategy, which I encourage everyone to read for your movements, for your life, for your community, for the world. She also has a new book called Pleasure Activism, which is incredible as well. She's just, just great. Just read anything Adrian writes. Um, but so doing that work with Morgan, with Adrian, with all of these incredible people in community, I really realize that the way that you know visionary fiction when you encounter it is two different main pieces, identity and power. And so identity, looking at what, so what would those principles be? Visionary fiction centers the leadership of people who are marginalized and most affected. It is not a story about a privileged person suddenly realizing there's oppression and then somehow be becoming better than oppressed people at their stuff in a day, right? In one training montage. <laughs> hey guys, I can cook food better than you. <laughs> nope. Um, <clears throat> so it sees through the eyes of the oppressed. It is the oppressed story. And recognizing that that's not just about adding in additional stories that fundamentally changes everything about a story, right? And I think about the example of Blade Runner. How many folks have seen the original Blade Runner? I like y'all. <laughs> so I saw that first, I saw it way too young, so I did not like it because it was very slow. I was like, what? Oh my god, are they taking a test? Why, why do people take a test? <laughs> didn't like it because it is, in fact, the story of a slave catcher, right? Deckard, who is the main character, lives in this future where his job is to chase down androids, replicants who have run away from captivity, from brutal, uh, oppressive captivity. He chases them down and murders them. And it's about his angst and how hard of a job that is. <laughs> like, I was like, yeah, little Melina, you were right. <laughs> I don't like this. And every time, I mean, I have watched it, and every multiple times, every time I watch it, I'm like, I like, I want to see the story through the eyes of the replicant. I want to hear the story through the eyes of Roy Batty, who is the lead replicant. Or even more, I want to hear the story from Chris, who is a female replicant who is tagged as a pleasure bot. And so you can only imagine the horrific gendered violence that she has lived through. What would that story look like? from her perspective, and how, how much of a horrific monster would Deckard be if we saw through her eyes? There would be no sympathy or emotional investment in this, in this brutal slave catcher. And so it is incredibly important, in my opinion, to, you know, to not just be adding in additional voices, but to change absolutely the center, because it allows us to reimagine the entire story, and that allows us to have different outcomes, different happy endings, and to understand power dynamics much more clearly. Um, visionary fiction is intersectional. So it recognizes that the people who live at the intersections of, of oppression, queer and trans, folks of color, immigrant folks who are dealing with um, ability access, all of the, and so many more iterations and permutations, that is where true liberation exists. Because when the, those folks' leadership vision and values are centered, it makes our entire community healthier and more whole. And so many of the stories in Octavia's group focus on that. Um, one of them is uh, called Hollow by Mia Mingus. And it is about a future where folks with disabilities are called unperfects. People who are normatively able are called perfects. And the perfects attempt to commit a genocide against the unperfects. The unperfects fight back in a guerrilla war and are able to, to continue existing. 
So the, the solution is to put the imperfects on a moon. And the idea is they'll go there and they'll die without us, right? Because they can't exist without us. What they do is build the most beautiful, imaginative, uh, inclusive, visionary community that centers everyone's needs, that has so many different multiple access points and entry points for everyone. They, they create, take this dead moon and create a utopia that makes everyone feel supported and centered. Um, so absolutely, it has to be intersectional. So the first piece is identity, right? But then, sort of doing this work, realizing identity is not enough because if you tell the same story of the, the military white dude in a spacesuit who saves the, the world by himself, making that like a queer, black, working class single mom, I will watch the shit out of that, let's be clear. <laughs> I will watch that movie again and again. I'd be like, y'all just want to come over and watch this movie with me? That would be a dope movie. But it doesn't get us to the futures we want because it is still about a hierarchy, it is still about individualism. Inserting brown people into these existing roles doesn't fundamentally change the roles. And doing that is actually inauthentic because if you actually put oppressed people into these stories, in authentic ways, it entirely changes the stories because of the experiences and conditions of oppressed people. So it, it allows us to see power in a number of different ways. We have to engage with power. And to me, this is one of the hardest pieces of visionary fiction. Because especially you're imagining, you're like this is, you can go as far as the limits of your imagination. And so like, how do I imagine a different power dynamic than everything that I've been told from the day I got here is unquestionable? How do I do that in a way that is believable and authentic and true to the reader and to me? So there's a number of different ways visionary fiction deals with power. It's about engaging with existing power dynamics. It's about making visible systems of power that have been invisible, invisibilized. And I think, again, the, the most difficult part, it's about imagining different relationships to power. And so, you know, you can say that, but what, like, what does that mean on the ground? Well, one of the ways to tell if you're like, oh, I'm reading visionary fiction, I think, is it? Is that if you're looking at how change is being made in that book, and I should have done this disclaimer before, but I'm gonna do it now, because my caffeine is kicking in. So. <laughs> be visionary fiction, right? One of the amazing things Adrian talks about in her emergent strategy work is that our movements should be creating as many entry points as possible. One of the principles of emergent strategy is growing more possibilities. And so it's really about saying yes and rather than no but. So it doesn't have to be visionary fiction. If you want a straight dystopia, if you want a straight utopia, which are not visionary fiction, um, if, you, if you want that story of that dude who wakes up and he's like, there's oppression, guys, what's up? I mean, he can't do what brown people do better than they do, right? But he can't be like, oh no, there's oppression. Let me figure out how to like, actually be a real ally and get involved, right? Those stories all have their place. I think some of those stories have had a lot more than their place, right? <laughs> those stories are like, excuse me! <laughs> They're just like mansplaining, you know, manspreading. Um, and you're like, come on, stories, put your legs together, make some space, make some space. <laughs> so, making space for visionary fiction that is like, can you can y'all just let me breathe, though? Um, so I, I focus on visionary fiction because I think it's an area that is incredibly useful to us and is, uh, one where there has not been as much space given. Um, but it's a yes and, not a no but. So again, when you're looking at visionary fiction, the change that's happening in the story should be generative. And like Adrian said, it should create more possibilities, more ideas. It's holistic and to the bone. It is not surface reform. It's not just about, you know, let's take away the most repressive laws that leave the systems intact. And I won't go on my, like, I have so many, like, franchise rants, but Harry Potter, you know, right? Um, sorry for any spoilers as well. It's been a long time, so there, you can't be spoiler free with Harry Potter. But, you know, at the, at the end of this epic story, fundamentally, this society has not changed, right? We've defeated Voldemort, 
these oppressive structures still in place, magical creatures are not even second class citizens, squids still can't go to school, right? If you don't have magic, you're unimportant. Like these hierarchies are not affected. And I'm like, that's what I care about. I don't care that these, these like hetero couples got married, had babies, and are sending them off to the academy and named them after like really gross weird people. <laughs> like, I don't care about any of that, right? It's not just surface reform. It's not enough to just remove the most evil person and be like, we're good though, right? That's not real liberation or transformative change. Um, it's from the bottom up, not the top down. It's not a decree. It's not something that gets passed in the Supreme Court. It is something that happens and is generated from the people who are most effective, collectively and together in a decentralized way. So there's not the ruling committee that decides, the revolutionary ruling committee, right? Um, it is everyone coming together. It's non-transactional, this change. And I think that, that you know, it's an anti-capitalist kind of change. So specifically, the change is not about <laughs> saying, you know, you have to, you know, you bring this, I bring this, we're gonna pull, pull this together in this, um, sort of commodification of resources and individuals. It recognizes that we may not all be able to bring the equal amount, but what we're creating is generative. It will create more. There's not a limited amount of resources that we then have to divvy up. There is an abundance. And so we will come together, we will all bring what we have, it will not be equal, and we will find that we have more than enough of what we need to win and to create the worlds that we want. It's relational. It recognizes the relationship between two people is not only as important as the larger systems, it's a reflection of the larger systems. It's fractal, right? Adrian, that's one of her principles for emergent strategy is fractal. You can look at the smallest piece and it reflects the whole. So if you look at the relationship between two people who are making change and that relationship is exploitative, it is weak, it is abusive, then that is what will be reflected. And then the change we're seeking will just replicate. And that's often what we see in uh, you know, sci-fi or uh, imaginative fiction that's attempting to create some sort of revolutionary society. We get a District 13 from Hunger Games, right? That at the end of the day, you're like, oh, they're just as exploitative as the oppressors, as the capital. So at the end of the day, Everyone's going to exploit each other. So why not just get with the dude who's closest to you and pop out some babies? <laughs> That's really the lesson to be learned from <laughs> So just, I'm like, I, anyone who hasn't read it, like kids, I'm like, just don't read the third book. Just stop it too. You will, oh, you'll feel so much better about life and possibility and revolution. So anyway, back to my point. I thought I would stay focused and not go on rants. So will not go on my Star Wars rant. I promise you that today. Because <laughs> I'm still reeling. Um, it's relational. And so recognizing that, if, again, if we are building exploitative relationships between each other, then we can't possibly build anything different. It is focused on decolonized, nonlinear dreaming. And uh, I will not go on a time travel rant either. <laughs> time is so short, and I have so many rants, y'all. But the, the focus on this is really understanding that visionary fiction is, is rooted in communities of color. It is, it, that's not to say white folks can't write it, but it's, it's you are coming into a space that has been held by other folks and has been protected. Um, and is rooted in an understanding that um, the colonial notion of, of sci-fi is rooted in imperial progress, right? That we're moving from savagery, from, from communities of color, from roundness, through the insertion of whiteness, literally towards whiteness, right? Because the future in these narratives is always all white and all chrome and it's all shiny and you're like, everything and everyone wears like all white and I'm like, I guess, we don't eat sloppy joes in the future. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that, is, that is a colonial racist notion of the future. The reality is when we root in decolonized liberation, we understand that time is not linear, that, that the future is not linear, that the, we are actually dreaming in concert with the ancestors who came before us that their dreams are what we need to guide us to the future, their wisdom, their work, and that we can move fluidly back and forth from the present to the future to the past, 
that what has gone before is not lost from us, that it's actually always available um, for us to build these futures that, that we have. And the last piece about visionary fiction is visionary fiction is not neutral, and we don't, we don't purport to be neutral. We are very proud that we are not neutral. Uh, Adrian says, all art either advances or regresses justice. And we are very clear we are on the side of advancing justice. And so I think that that understanding is very important for, for anyone creating art, right? That all art either advances or regresses justice. And if you think, my art is neutral, the reality is then your art is probably unconsciously replicating status quo, which is oppressive. And so again, all of us as artists have a responsibility to think about what we're creating, where it came from, what it's doing, and, and the legacy that it's going to have into the future. So those are the principles of visionary fiction. <laughs> and then I just wanted to, I wanted to leave some time to have dialogue with y'all, or nerd rants, whichever. Um, but I did want to give a couple examples, um, not so much of the, the writing, uh, which is important, right? You know, we created Octavia's Brood as this anthology to put in the world to say, here are some folks practicing visionary fiction. I think a lot of us are continuing to write visionary fiction, visionary fiction, um, or to create it in a lot of different ways. Um, I'm actually working on a abolition sci-fi film project right now with a friend, um, which is super nerdy and awesome and fun. Uh, <laughs> So, you know, I think that it's important that act of, of creation and to obviously embody all of these um, in that as a visionary fiction writer. But for us, it's also incredibly important that visionary fiction is not just something for writers or for artists, right? The notion of visionary fiction is imaginative creation of our futures. And that is something for everyone to be involved in. And so um, our goal has been to create spaces where folks can imagine and dream and play together. And so we created a number of different workshops to create that, that space, to bring people together, whether they consider themselves writers or not. Because we all, all of our brilliance is needed to create revolutionary liberated futures. And so one of them is the collective sci-fi visioning workshop, where folks get together, um, pick an issue, a social issue, and then they build worlds that allow them to explore it. And it's really amazing that in like 30 minutes, strangers come up with these epic stories. Like one literally, they were like, and then in the third book, I'm just like, you've been sitting here together. You didn't even know her name 10 minutes ago. What is happening? It's amazing. <laughs> Um, so that one Morgan Phillips and I developed. This one Morgan Phillips developed initially and then we did some work on it. Um, but this one is like the, it, it, of course Morgan came up with it. She's like the best nerd ever, y'all. Like you should follow her on Instagram because she does cosplay. She's learned to weld, to tan leather. Like she's made every outfit Ray on Star Wars has ever worn. It's amazing. She made her, she went like welded her own like fighter pilot helmet, like that old fighter. Who, what? And she was, she was like, I don't know how to weld, but I guess I'll learn. <laughs> um, so she made this workshop that takes existing franchises and allows us to engage and subvert them, which I think is, as nerds, is so important, right? Because we have invested so much energy. Like, I learned Klingonese, y'all, like self-taught, because my mom would like, pay for Klingon language camp. <laughs> That's not a real language. <laughs> uh, that's cool, Mom. That's cool. I'm over it. Uh, but we've invested a lot in these worlds, and yet, you know, as much as we love them, as radical nerds, these worlds also replicate a lot of the oppressive structures that you're like, oh, why did you do that? So Morgan created this workshop where folks get into groups based on their nerd preference. Uh, so, you know, you could be Star Wars, Star Trek, Willy Wonka, Harry Potter, Wizard of Oz, whatever you want. <coughs> you embody the most oppressed people within that world, and then you create an organizing goal and develop direct action tactics to get that organizing goal. Y'all, it's amazing. The best one was there was a Willy Wonka group. Of course, I think I'm Bulumbus, right? The best part of it 
too much people are never like, well, I think the Oompa Loompas should organize. They're like, we the Oompa Loompas demand respect. <laughs> I'm like, whoa, okay. So uh, the Oompa Loompas are over there and they're like, we are shutting this factory down until we can unionize. We deserve health care and vacation. We need money to buy food because we need chocolate. Chocolate, y'all. You can't live on chocolate. You definitely need to go to the dentist. I was like, this is great. What you're doing is super awesome. And I'm like, so if you're going to shut down this chocolate factory, you might need to think about how are you going to communicate that to the people of this town? Because these people clearly love them some chocolate. And if you don't talk to them, Will and Mom are going to be like, I don't know, they took your chocolate, y'all, right? Which is what we see happen every time when you go on strike. They're like, they took it from you. And they're like, that's right, that's right. I'm like, okay, cool. I walk away, and then I hear someone scream, flash mobs, Oompa Loompas, but perfectly built for flash mobs. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> I was like, my mission in this world has been completed. A little early, um, but I'm good. I can die happy. So that's what I mean. I didn't need to talk so much. <laughs> it's an amazing first shot. I want to share, and then I just want to have a few minutes to dialogue, is um, this one that I uh, developed and then Morgan helped me with, which is the People's Encyclopedia 27, 70 edition. So the idea of it is that you are writing the futures you want as historical fact in this encyclopedia from the year 2070, where we have been having wins. It's a zine project. And so I've done it in a bunch of different situations. The last place I did it was at a youth prison um, here in Oregon with um, the black cultural group there. And that was amazing. And they focused on criminal legal issues. And it was just phenomenal. And so, oh, that, that was supposed to, there was supposed to be more pictures there. But they're not there. So you could see the pages underneath. But you know, people write incredible entries. Um, this one was about a farm workers uprising of 2020, which when it, you know, three years ago, that was the future, now it's here. So get ready for that uprising. <laughs> um, some people draw, like this one is just uh, borders and then a world with no borders by 2070. But it's been one of the most empowering workshops I've been part of to see people claim the futures that they want as historical fact. We claim the past with such certainty, right? As, uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm also a historian, and so as someone who's engaged in trying to be a, a revolutionary radical historian, you know, as we uncover these real histories, we're like, this is what happened. But when we talk about the future, we talk about it in ways that are, you know, very tentative. Well, I hope this will happen, this might be the outcome. All we can do is do our best and see what happens. And I want us to claim those futures with the same certainty that we claim the past. Again, in that space of challenging linear time, that the future can already be written, and not in a you know Terminator bad way, but in a you know in a in a positive way, we can write the future, and then all we have to do is make it a reality. The very act of writing it, of, of framing it as something that has passed, then makes it a certainty. And I I want us to have spaces to practice doing that. And you know, really all of this is about creating spaces for folks to practice and to play because we don't have enough spaces for that. We also don't have enough spaces. It's one thing to say, tell someone like, you should change how you're thinking about this. And you're like, okay, that's a lot. Because I've been thinking this way for decades. So I'm gonna need a little bit of time. So I feel like we need to create more and more you know, no stake spaces where folks can, you know, imagine, play things out, think about, you know, if we're not just thinking in a, on a two-year grant cycle, but if we're thinking 100 years out, how do we get there? How can we start talking about it and imagining it and then have people be like, oh, seems like maybe we're slipping into a little bit of a dictatorship there. Maybe we should back up, rather than doing that in the real world where it's literally life and death. Um, so, you know, the creation of these workshops is about hopefully generating new writers. There, there have been writers that have come out of this. I just, someone um, just put out a book who did our workshop and said to me after the workshop, they said, um, I, I actually ended up, it was at a conference, and they were like, I ended up at the wrong workshop, but I was stuck in the back and it was really crowded. So I was trapped because it felt awkward to try and leave. Um, and then they were like, but I'm so glad I'm here because I never liked science fiction and now I do. And it just released a sci-fi book. And I was like, this is so exciting. <laughs> so obviously I, I, you know, I hope as, as a nerd and 
ambassador, that that is someone that comes out. Um, but I think more, I, I'm hoping that folks are able to create more ways to incorporate radical, liberated, visionary dreaming into everything that they do. Um, and all of our movements, our communities, um, because I think we absolutely are going to need that if we're, I think we can tear down this world without that, but I don't think that we can build the world that we want um, without having these kinds of imaginative spaces to engage in. So I'm going to stop there, and I'd love if anyone has questions, comments.